It was the final weekend in September and fall colors had reached their peak. Of course, that meant I was going to head up north to Algonquin Park. I was hoping to base camp at one site for the entire trip, but I was booking last minute, and for the last night of the trip, there were very few options still available. The final itinerary was two nights on Big Porcupine, and then one night on Bonacher. Although, a small crisis with Elo made me skip the night on Bonacher and leave one day early. Everything ended up being okay, but it was a pretty crazy few days. Don't worry, I'll explain everything that happened throughout the video. My trip started from Smoke Lake. I headed south towards the forest portage of the trip, the 250 meter into Ragged Lake. I kept moving south towards the infamous Devil Staircase portage that would take me to my destination for the evening, Big Porcupine Lake. Move my canoe on top, my barrel on my back, my camera here on top of my barrel, and then eel on the waist. And despite it being a lot of weight that I'm carrying in a very heavy load on a very uphill portage, it's quite pretty with, oh, with the leaves. Wouldn't you say so, Elo? Wouldn't you say this is a pretty portage? This is pretty, Elo. Let's go, this way, this way. Oh man. It's been a few, oh, it's been a few years since I've done this portage. Oh. And this is what we're climbing up. The Devil's Staircase. Lots of stairs. Lots of yellow pulling. Oh, I'm gonna be tired after this. You want some water? Take some water. Okay. Good girl. I just finished both carries of the portage. Put all my gear, my canoe. I decided to collect some firewood while I was here because there was some really good firewood right on the trail. And now the issue is, I don't know how I'm going to fit all of my gear, plus ELO, plus all of the firewood into my canoe. It's already a pretty full canoe with ELO without any firewood. Um, so I'm going to have to figure this out. And it's super windy, a headwind. So I'm going to be moving very slow with all of that weight in the boat. It's going to be a very heavy boat and I'm going to be inching my way to find a campsite. But I'm in no particular rush. Okay, let's get going anyway. Let's figure out how to do this. Okay, I figured it out. Barrel, pack, where they usually are. My yoke is hidden underneath all that wood. So I have a couple pieces of wood there, a couple pieces there. The majority, or like a half of it is there. I put the other half on this side to even it out weight-wise, um, just so it's not side heavy. So half the wood on either side. And then everything else is where it normally goes. My the pack is under the seat, um, camera in front of me. So the only thing is going to be my legs are going to be just tight on this side. They'll have to just stay basically centered in there. But I sacrificed a little bit of my leg room to give Elo her full space for herself. Other than this one piece that's going to get in her way. But otherwise she... Oh, no, 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 not yet. Otherwise she gets the whole front of herself like usual. Because Elo is my priority. I don't want her to be comfortable and happy on this trip. But it's a pretty loaded and heavy canoe. So we'll see how, how movement goes. Okay, you want to get going? Yeah, let's get going, okay. This is going to be a little bit tight for a tent spot, but I'm going to try and make it work. It's grassy at the front over a cliff ledge, but it's right by the water's edge, which means from my tent, I'll get this view, and that would be pretty sweet. 
and it's gonna be a full moon all night. Like the moon rises right as the sun sets and the moon set is right as the sun rises. So also the closer I have it away from any trees, like the more in the open I have it, um, the more moon glow, moon illumination I'll get. And that's my tent setup. Pretty sweet. Campsites there, massive rock there, tent with a view. Sleeping bag at the bottom as a ground sheet. My sleeping pad, Elo's sleeping pad, and then a bed sheet that I'm gonna wrap around both of them to make kind of just a double mattress bed. Okay, so we're all set up. So it's kind of just like a, a bed. Going all out for Elo and making sure she's comfortable and warm. And me too, it's a nice little luxury. It's, you know, I had the space and I was able to afford the weight. So this is what I'm prioritizing is the bed setup. Um, my sleeping pad, which is winter rated. Elo sleeping pad, which is the a Mech Juniors. Mech Little Dipper, I think it's called. Um, it was meant for kids. I even gave Elo a pillow with my empty dry bag there's a couple things in there like underwear and socks and just a microfiber towel there's like a pillowcase like she's living in luxury here that's the tent setup in the corner i just have my electronics batteries and charging and stuff it's better to keep it in the tent where it's slightly warmer than outside where the batteries will drain quicker keep it in the corner it's just weighing down the bed sheet so that when i toss and turn um, the bed sheet doesn't move that's weighing it down and here over there I put my Nalgene and Bear Spray, um, which also will weigh down the bed sheet on Elo's side. And I like to keep both of those things handy just in case they are needed in the middle of the night. And this is the view that we have. Pretty epic. There was lots of firewood left over at the campsite, but I decided to go and collect some more. I would be at this campsite for two nights, so I wanted to gather a nice inventory. Luckily, the campsite adjacent to mine was unoccupied, so I was able to walk past that site into the forest to get some good firewood. After a few hours of work, it was time for dinner. It's a bit of a science, adding the perfect amount of water to the dehydrated meal. You either add too little and it's gross, like sticky and clumpy, or you add too much and then it's just a soup. I think I nailed it with this one. It tastes really good. The tomato sauce like tastes like legit good tomato sauce. Pasta is like perfect texture. It's a, it's a good meal. Let's go. Let's go. Sit.
Sit. Sit. It was a gorgeous evening on Big Porcupine Lake. The entire south half of the lake was completely empty. I went to check out a handful of campsites, including the Grand Cliff site midway through the lake on the eastern shoreline. Elo and I spent a little while enjoying the views from that site. Elo, do you want to climb up to the top with me? Okay, let me go through. Okay, let's go up top. What do you do? You're a regular. Wow. I wonder how you come up here. Can you say so, Elo? Obviously, if I was camping here and knowing me, I'd probably figure out a way to pitch my tent right there, make the fire there. I'd probably never even go inside. Just because I'm weird like that. This is all I need to be happy. A view from up here. Just open space to explore, small fire pit, small tent spot. I probably would just do that, pitch my tent there behind the log. It's very protected. Day two was extremely pretty. 
The sun was rising behind my campsite, so it was shining its morning glow onto the opposing shoreline across from my site. The combination of the clouds in the sky, the mist sweeping across the lake, my overturned red canoe by the water, and the colorful fall foliage created a landscape so beautiful, I spent a solid few hours just sitting and admiring it. Let's go back up. Let's go. Come on. Oh, you go this way. You go this way. Oh. <laughs> this is my day pack. It's where I keep all of my important quick access stuff. In here, I have a patch kit, I have extra water tabs, an extra lighter, and uh, another copy of my map for the trip, whatever trip I'm doing. And here I have, right now I have an anchor power bank. Um, normally it's where I keep the red rope that's on my canoe, um, and sometimes just a pair of gloves, like warm gloves. Just quick stuff. Here I have bear spray, I have my Garmin Enrich Mini in this little pelican, I have the gloves in here now, and here I have medication and um, a quick access first aid kit. So there's bandages, gauze, um, Advil, Pepto, just mini first aid kit and then medication is stored in here in the zippered pocket. Um, and then lastly I have this which is my quick access electronics. I have another ziplock of electronics but that ziplock gets packed away so I keep this with me at all times. So in my quick access I have extra batteries for my GoPro 7, GoPro 10, my Canon R7, I have one small power bank because usually the anchor gets packed away, so one power bank to charge phone. I have a charging cable for iPhone and for um, micro USB, which is pretty much anything else. And then at the bottom here is a um, little like Swiss Army card type style thing of extra memory cards for, I have micro SD and SD, so for my Canon and my GoPros. And a new method that I've been doing this year, which I've really enjoyed so far, is these yellow elastic bands, rubber bands. So I keep them all stored on this power bank. So this is like the housing for them all. And then as a battery runs out, I put a band around it. So this battery is empty. This battery is empty. These batteries are all full. It makes it a lot easier when I need to swap out a battery, especially if I'm quick on time, as opposed to plugging in because I keep four or five spare batteries for every device on top of the power banks. So if I'm on like the last one or two with battery and I need to figure out which one it is, it's kind of a pain in the butt to swap in and out three, four batteries to figure out. So now I know there's a yellow elastic around it. They're out of juice. And then if I charge them, I just take the yellow elastic off and put it back here. So this is my situation right now. So I just switched GoPro batteries. I'm filming this with a GoPro. So this is the one that was dead. I swapped out. The new one is in. Now I'm going to take down the barrel and do a campsite tour.
Okay, well, you want to get on the campsite tour? Okay, let's do it. Let's do that. Let's go. Let's get on the campsite tour. So this is the front of the campsite. Pretty epic. Lots of rock. I'm sure I'll go down and I'll show you so you can also see the view up. Yeah, very big, grand, rocky shoreline. I'm happy well on my waist right now. So this is just where I store the canoe overnight. Official campsite marker. Big rocky shoreline. This is the climb up, so it's a little bit of a climb up with your gear. There's a little root step. This, it's surprisingly sturdier than it would look. So it's the perfect little long shot. Oh, Elo, come on. Oh, good girl, good jump. Okay, and you're in the main site. Um, fire pit is pretty good. The ring of rocks wasn't great, so I rearranged it and it is significantly better now. You got that bench, which doesn't serve much purpose. This isn't flat, that one's not flat. Those look recently cut. This one's kind of flat, but it's all you know, worn out, so not the most flat. So I just have my chair, my barrel. My gear is stored over there, just under my tarp. Um, the barrel hang that I did is right down there. There's a little opening. So I found a nice branch there. And then let's keep going. So this is the awesome rock I spent pretty much all morning just sitting on this rock with Evo, um, enjoying the view out. He has a pretty awesome view of a big porcupine. I have my socks drying right now. So that's the island with three campsites on it. That's the island with one campsite on it. Okay, let's keep going. Let's keep going, Hilo. Come on. Come on. Um, so I pitched my tent in not the best spot. Um, right at the edge of the cliff. Pretty cool, but kind of dangerous. Um, but it gets the moon set is right there. So I got all of the moonlight overnight and got to watch it set when I woke up at 5.30. Um, yeah, it's just a really pretty view to wake up to. But yeah, I added all of this just as a barrier so that when Elo's getting in another tent, there's no room for her to slip it's way too close to the cliff as you can see it's basically two elos equivalent not the best tent spot i would not recommend it for other people it's also just very small and there's barely enough room for me to sleep flat um, here is a better spot pretty much anywhere else so there's the campsite and just there you can pitch a tent um, there's a better spot just behind these trees here so just a short walk away the only problem with these spots is you're getting closer to the next campsite which i'll take you to in a minute but like that right there and this right there is probably the best spot in my opinion it's the flattest of them all um, so this is my backup plan if the cliff one didn't work i would have came here and probably chosen this one um thunder box is back that way it's okay for some reason there's duct tape all over um, i guess maybe the box is rotting or something so someone tried to fix it um yeah not crazy about that so i've been using the other campsites as you can see, the other campsite is right here. So it took me all of 12 seconds to walk between sites. I'm hoping this goes unoccupied tonight, but the lake is fully booked. Um, so I'm guessing that someone will be occupying it. Um, but it's not a great site at all, really. Like the water access is not good. The fire pit and seating, very below par. And what is this fire pit? It's a bunch of big rocks and open pit. The seating, there's not a flat seat in the house. Yeah, that's the landing there. So it's a very tiny landing with a very steep incline up to a very average site. Compared to my site, which is completely open, has gorgeous views, huge rocky shoreline. This is literally like 20 feet away and it's the exact opposite. All of the views are covered by trees at the perimeter of the shoreline. There's no rocky shoreline other than like little chunks here and there, but not really good to enjoy. Um, yeah, everything about it kind of is just bad. Um, there are a few good tent spots, like here's a big open space. You can pitch at least one or two tents. 
Um, and the Thunderbox is better than mine. It's pretty close to the site. Like, so there's the fire pit and there's the Thunderbox. It does face the other way, so like it is more than private enough. So it looks like an old Thunderbox used to be right here. Looks like an old one used to be right there. I'm not sure why they needed to change Thunderboxes so many times for a site that probably doesn't get used that much. But who knows, these could be decades old. Okay, I'm going to pause the video here. You know the title, A Small Crisis? Well, it's time to explain that. I went to use the Thunderbox and collect some more firewood while I was in the forest. I was walking north alongside the swampy bog that was adjacent to the campsites. Hilo was running around, chasing squirrels, you know, typical fun dog stuff. But that's when everything went downhill. I heard Elo drinking water. That wasn't good. The only water source beside us was the bog, and it was very, very, very gross. Especially at the water's edge where she was drinking. She was no more than 15 feet away from me, but I immediately ran over to her. In all of her excitement, and probably thinking that I was chasing her, she decided to jump straight into the water. My heart dropped. I very quickly gave the come here command. She was only in the water for about 5-10 to 10 seconds, but that was long enough to get her full coat covered with the muck, and it was definitely long enough for me to get angry, stressed, and extremely anxious about what had just happened. I had a big decision to make. Should I continue on with the trip and go to Bonacher, or should I head home a day early? It was a decent travel day back to my car, and it would be even longer if I was traveling from Bonacher Lake. Plus, the time it would take to pack up camp beforehand, load my car when I got to the access, and then do the 3 hour drive to get home. If she started showing any symptoms, it would be really, really not ideal. No matter what I decided, Elo was staying on her leash 100% of the rest of the trip, either in my hands or securely tethered. Absolutely no exceptions. This is an unfortunate but great example why the leash rules exist, and I'm sharing this story so that other people can be aware and learn from the mistake that I made. But for now, let's get back to the video. But then surrounding both of the sites is this really gross bog marsh. This is what Ela went swimming in and drank from. She drank straight from it, um, which made me very, very upset. And that's why she is not leaving her leash for the rest of the trip. Yeah, so she drank from it. And now I'm very paranoid about whether or not she will get sick. And if she does, when it will happen and how bad the symptoms will be depends what was in the water that was consumed. Um, but yeah, so I'm definitely nervous for Elo right now. And obviously I'm filming this while I'm on the trip, so I can give an update if anything does happen. But for now she's okay. But yeah, very unhappy. I, you know, let her have some fun, chase some squirrels while I was collecting some wood. Next thing you know, I hear her drinking. Um, and I knew it was obviously from the bog because that's the only water that she could have had access to. So I was only, you know, 15 feet away from her, so immediately I went to grab her. She was excited because she thought I was chasing her, and she just jumped straight in and went swimming in it. So then when I yelled, come here, she listened and came to me. Um, and then I brought her straight to my campsite and put her into the lake water to wash off whatever was on her from the bog water. Um, and then yeah, I washed her off like two or three times. Obviously, like, I don't have any shampoo or soap or scrub like I just dunked her in the water and brought her out so hopefully that was good enough and yeah this site that I'm on I forgot how epic is the good word it looks from the water like it's just so open um, and exposed and you see all of the rocky shoreline like from inside the site you don't see the extent of the rocky shoreline but when you're from the water it looks pretty pretty grand and epic yeah this is my wood I have for the evening Tons and tons of wood, and I have a nice warm fire for a while. I have a bowl always set up in the same spot for Elo. I determine the spot right when we get to the campsite, and she knows that's her water spot. She just drags me right here to get the drink because she knows that's where there's water and there's always fresh water in the bowl. I never let it go empty, so she drank from the bog water out of just pure excitement or who knows why, but it wasn't for lack of having other water. And then this is where the barrel hang is, and where I hung my barrel. There's also another little mini landing. It's beach instead of rock, which is better, except it's too uh, shallow, like it's not deep enough that 
I don't trust the canoe and there's nowhere to really tie the canoe unless I start wrapping it around to this tree up here so I didn't want to leave my canoe there okay that's a long video showing the campsite but yeah I'm very happy with the site it's a beautiful site for two days in the good weather that I have I can get shade when I want it be in the sun when I want it it has everything I was still pretty stressed out with the whole ELO situation, so I decided to go for a paddle to clear my head. The lake was calm and I was lucky to spot some small wildlife on the lake. When I got back to camp, I spent a few hours relaxing at the shoreline, enjoying the beautiful weather and gorgeous fall colours. I've got this to get the fire started, some birch and some smaller twigs. These are my medium sized pieces. These are my big pieces. And these are my bigger pieces. And this will be my stash for the evening, which is plenty. And then I collected this as well. I can break it down and use it if I need to, but otherwise I'm hoping to just leave this pile behind. Okay, new fire stash for the night. I got even more. And this still isn't even all of it. This is probably the most firewood I've ever personally had at a campsite. That's a pretty good hang. It's very far from any branch or tree trunk. It's pretty much hanging in the middle of nowhere. I always find it funny. You know, they talk about how bears are so smart, you're never going to outsmart a bear when you hang your food because they'll figure out a way. A determined bear will figure it out. Bears are really smart. They would just come right here, take one swipe with their claw, and it would fall straight down. Bears are still stupid. Ready to go for a paddle? By the early evening, Elo seemed to be doing fine. She had no symptoms and showed no signs of discomfort, so I was pretty happy with that. 
we went for a long paddle to look for wildlife. We were unsuccessful with finding any large animals, but it was a calm, relaxing paddle nonetheless, and we got to watch a family of mergansers at the tail end of the paddle before getting back to camp. This is the view from inside the tent at 6.30 a.m. Eva, are you on my sleeping pad? You can't go on my sleeping pad, Evo. But the moon is insane. It is so clear, the moon, like the craters, all the details of the moon are so clear. And all of the colors from the sun are shining on the trees, and it's very uncommon that you get both of those things together. Like, I don't think I've ever seen a moon in this setting. And the sky is like the slight pink-orange from the sun rising in the other side, because this is facing west. Underneath the moon, like, this looks like one of those images you see online that's a Photoshop of, like, a beautiful landscape, and then someone just plopped a Photoshop moon in the middle. Like that honestly looks like what I'm looking at right now. The morning of day three was one of the most beautiful mornings I've ever had in Algonquin Park, and that's not an exaggeration. But then, it happened. I heard Elo's stomach rumble, and then she threw up twice. I immediately started packing up camp. I knew that I needed to get back to the city as soon as possible before her symptoms got any worse. It was going to be a long day of portaging and paddling under the very hot sun with very few breaks but getting Elo safely back home was my number one priority. I'm doing the Devil's Staircase on day three. We're on our way down, let's go. So Elo had that bog mishap yesterday where I let my guard down for two minutes and she drank from and swam in the grossest, marshiest, boggiest water I've ever seen in my life. It was absolutely filthy. And this morning she threw up right after we got out of the tent. I was just starting to take some pictures. It was a beautiful, beautiful morning. And then I heard Hilo's stomach rumble and then she threw up. I packed up camp very quickly, got on the water at 8.15. And now I'm just trying to get back to my car as quick as possible. Right now it's about 9.15, 9.30. Doing my first carry of the Devil's Staircase. And uh, yeah, crossing my fingers. Wish me luck. Midway through the devil's staircase, Elo took a poop. I crossed my fingers and mumbled to myself, please be normal, please be normal, please be normal. And thankfully, it was. She was her normal self all day and seemed totally fine for the rest of the journey. When we arrived at Smoke Lake, I filled my Nalgene so that we would have water for the final paddle and for the drive home. That may not seem important right now, but trust me, it is.
The aftermath section is a bit lengthy, but stick around for these last few minutes. It's a bit of a roller coaster. I'm going to read exactly what I included from the full trip report on my website. I got home, took a shower, and started looking through my photos and videos. You know, standard post-trip routine stuff. I was still anxious about the whole swamp scenario from the day prior and Elo throwing up earlier in the morning. I figured it wouldn't hurt to call the emergency vet and see what they had to say. The emergency vet said they only treat symptoms, and based on Elo's symptoms, there was no need to bring her in. But they recommended that I speak with a toxicology specialist, so they gave me the phone number to ASPCA, Animal Poison Control Center. I spent an hour on the phone with APCC. I sent them pictures and videos of the questionable water source that Elo drank from and swam in. I explained everything in full detail. The lady that I was speaking with was extremely friendly and helpful. She put me on hold to check something with one of her colleagues. While I was on hold, I noticed that Ontario Parks had sent an email, literally one day earlier, about reports of blue-green algae on Smoke Lake. Algonquin Provincial Park has received reports of suspect blue-green algae on Smoke Lake. Users of Smoke Lake should be aware that water drawn in the vicinity of suspect algae should not be used for any purpose including drinking, washing, bathing, etc. Please ensure that pets are not consuming or swimming in any areas of concern. Yeah, so Elo and I each had consumed approximately 500 milliliters of water from Smoke Lake between 12pm and 5pm, and I went shin deep in the water while getting into the canoe. Ontario Parks sent the notice while I was already in the backcountry, you know, a place that doesn't typically have cell service. It would have been nice to see signs posted at the portages leading in and out of Smoke Lake, don't you think? With motorboats, they could have implemented that within an hour. It was kind of absurd that they didn't. For those unaware, blue-green algae is a naturally occurring microscopic bacteria. It cannot be treated with the standard water filters or purification methods that people use in the backcountry. Even boiling water does not destroy the toxins, and may even increase the effects of toxins produced by the blue-green algae blooms. In humans, blue-green algae toxicity causes a wide range of very not-so-fun symptoms, but thankfully, it's not fatal. For dogs, unfortunately, it's a different story. Some types of blue-green algae can be fatal for dogs literally within minutes or hours. There are horror stories of dog owners driving back from a park with their dog dying during the drive home. It's very sad and very scary. Other non-fatal types of blue-green algae can cause liver damage in dogs, and from what I was told, the dog can be asymptomatic while the damage is occurring. When APCC took me off hold, I explained my new finding about the blue-green algae on Smoke Lake, in addition to the questionable water source from the day prior. They said, okay, yeah, now you definitely need to bring Elo to the emergency vet as soon as possible, and I also needed to speak with Ontario Poison Control to see what I needed to do for myself. Thankfully, enough time had passed that APCC wasn't concerned about the water source being fatal to Elo, but they said the main concern was that there could be liver damage, so she needed to get her blood work done. Since COVID, the vet industry has been kind of crazy. There's way more demand than there is supply. To find an emergency vet on a Saturday night was basically impossible. I spent 30 minutes calling seven or eight different hospitals before I found one with capacity to see Elo. It was a 40 minute drive away from me. I got in the car immediately. The current time was 8 p.m. Once I was in the car, I turned my attention toward myself. Since I had left my parents' house at around 5 p.m., I was feeling a bit dizzy and nauseous, but honestly, that wasn't too uncommon for me at the end of a trip after a very long day of hustling under the very hot sun. Was I just feeling normal body shutdown symptoms, or was it the blue-green algae? One of my ankles was also itching really bad, but again, it could have just been mosquito bites. I wasn't about to become a hypochondriac. It took close to an hour of waiting on hold until I was able to speak to someone from Ontario Poison Control. I explained to them everything that happened, and they agreed that the dizziness and nausea and the itchy ankle wasn't conclusive enough to suggest blue-green algae toxicity. They explained that I should self-monitor for a total of six hours, and I was already near the end of that time frame, and if I had any of the following symptoms, then I needed to go to the ER. Persistent vomiting or diarrhea, severe abdominal pain, fever, seizure, or jaundice. Thankfully, I didn't have any of those and I was pretty confident based on the timeline that I was in the clear. Back to Elo. I arrived at the hospital close to 9pm. I was told that due to the recommendation from APCC, Elo would be seen immediately. That was simply not true. After three hours of waiting, I was finally given an update. I was told that based on her vitals, she was next in line to see the doctor. That didn't sound great. An hour later, they clarified and told me her vitals were completely normal, and her file was next for the doctor to look at. I was told her file is next since I had arrived four hours earlier. 
One of the vet technicians came out to speak with me and told me that we should do the blood work now so that when the doctor was ready to see Elo, there wouldn't be any delay. Sure, why not? I later found out, after calling APCC again, that the blood work should be done 12 hours after exposure, and if it was done any earlier than that, it should be repeated at the 12-hour point to confirm results. After another three hours, a total of seven hours for those keeping count, I was told once again, her file is next in line, but they couldn't tell me how much longer it would be. They said it could still take hours. I was quite upset about the blood work situation too, because I was going to need to redo the blood work a second time, but only because of the recommendation from the vet technician that said, let's do it now. I understand the concept of triage, but the communication and transparency at this place was beyond terrible. It was now 3 a.m. on Sunday morning. Keep in mind, my day had started Saturday morning at 6.30 a.m. on Big Porcupine Lake. After a crappy sleep, I moved quickly to pack up camp. Then I spent five hours moving at a very quick pace while portaging and paddling under the hot sun. I drove three hours back to the city, spent one hour at my parents' house, close to two hours on the phone with APCC and emergency vet clinics, and then almost one hour in the car to get to the emergency vet. And then, another seven hours of waiting. To say it was a tiring and stressful day would be a massive understatement. At 3 a.m., I decided to go home. I told them to call me when Ela was ready to get picked up. I also told them they should be redoing the blood work at the 12-hour mark based on the APCC recommendation, and that there was no way I should be paying for that second set of blood work. By the time I got home and fell asleep, it was past 4 a.m., and then I awoke to a phone call at 5.30 a.m. that Ela was ready to get picked up. Thankfully, all of her blood work was normal. Any concern about blue-green toxicity was gone, but they said Elo still could have picked up bacteria or virus from the first questionable body of water, so I should just monitor her for symptoms over the coming days. I gave Elo the biggest hug and kiss when I picked her up, and then made it back home at 7.30 a.m. It had been more than 24 hours since day three started on Big Porcupine, and I'd only slept for around one hour. What a wild journey those last 24 hours had been. But it's impossible to stay mad at that face.